There are two events that we are recognizing today. The first event, the rebuilding of the temple, the return to Jerusalem. The second event, the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit descended upon the apostles, the believers, the disciples in Jesus Christ. It is my task today to kind of connect these two events together. So if you would bear with me, there'll be some history here, some numbers, some dates. You don't have to take notes. Uh, just to put the whole thing in perspective, the history, uh, the holy history of God's working with his people. About 45 years after Nebuchadnezzar uh, destroyed the temple in Jerusalem and, and brought the Jews into captivity in Babylon, uh, Cyrus the Persian defeated the Babylonians. And Cyrus the Persian, the Cyrus the Great, uh, was now in control. And so Cyrus, who was a man who believed very much in religious liberty, issued an edict saying that the Jews should now return to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple. Uh, he also gave them 5,400 articles that had been, a part of had been a part of the temple, of Solomon's temple, uh, which when Nebuchadnezzar sacked it had been taken off into Babylon and had been placed in the pagan temples of the Babylonians. And Cyrus returned all those articles to the Jews. And so under Zerubbabel, they returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Uh, the foundation was laid. It's very interesting, the mixed review. Uh, many were shouting and rejoicing that the, temp that the, the foundation of the Lord's house had now been put in place. But those who remembered Solomon's temple and the glory of Solomon's temple wept because Zerubbabel's temple came up short of the size and the magnitude and the glory of Solomon's temple. After much uh, political hassling and problems with the neighbors, uh, in 512 BC, the second temple was dedicated, Zerubbabel's temple. Now there were items from the second temple, there were items from Solomon's temple that were not in the second temple. Uh, the primary item being the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies in Solomon's temple. Uh, after Nebuchadnezzar sacked Jerusalem and destroyed the temple, uh, we don't know where that Ark of the Covenant is. Uh, I think a guy by the name of Indiana Jones found it in a snake pit in Egypt. I mean, you want to believe that? In, after the 930 service, I had a woman come up to me who's here with her sister, and she came from here from California, and she had some very good Jewish friends in California. One man in particular was very much involved in the religion of Judaism, and he had made a statement. She had made a statement to him that no one knows where the ark is, and he said, we know where it is. It's in Paris. Now, I, I don't know how much truth there is to that. It would seem to me that if you're going to hide the ark somewhere, maybe the last place, uh, no, we won't go there. But anyway, the Ark of the Covenant was not present. Now, the, the rabbis in what is called the Talmud, okay? There are two Talmuds, the Jerusalem Talmud, the Babylonian Talmud. These are large volumes of books, which are the sayings of the rabbis. And in the Babylonian Talmud, uh, there is a statement regarding the second temple. And it's, it's very interesting. And they say that the second temple, what was missing was, first of all, the Shekinah glory of God, the, the cloud that descended upon Solomon's temple, uh, where the glory of God filled the temple. And what was also missing was, in Hebrew, the Ruach HaGodesh, the spirit of holiness, or what we would call the Holy Spirit. So if you went into Solomon's temple, um, there was something there. There was a spiritual reality there. The Holy Spirit was there. Uh, there was a presence of God in the place. You, I'm sure they, they sensed that there was something there. But when the second temple was built, um, I guess it was kind of an empty temple. The, the Ark of the Covenant wasn't there. The Shekinah glory of God wasn't there. The Holy Spirit wasn't there. They did their religious rituals. They performed their festivals and their feasts, but it was kind of an empty religion. But there's some interesting things about this second temple. In 321, Alexander the Great 
conquered the world and spread Greek culture. He died at the age of 30. His empire was divided up among his generals. Uh, the Ptolemies were in Egypt, the Seleucids were in Syria with Antioch as their capital. First, the Ptolemies ruled over Palestine, but they lost in a battle to the Syrian emperors. And finally, the Syrians, the Seleucids ruled over Palestine. And there was one emperor, Antiochus Epiphanes, um, came into Jerusalem, entered the temple of God, the second temple, and he built an altar to Zeus the pagan god, and of all things, he sacrificed a pig on the altar. Now, if you want to get Jews ticked off, sacrifice a pig on their altar. And that's what he did, and he succeeded. Uh, there was a revolt that took place led by a man by the name of Judas Maccabeus and his brother Jonathan. Now, those of you familiar with these, the, the Roman Catholic Bible, uh, it's the same as ours, except it has these 13 apocryphal books, intertestamental books. And um, uh, two of them is First and Second Maccabees. Makes for good reading. It talks about the revolt of the Jews against the Seleucid kings and gaining their independence. And so the Jews were independent for 100 years. Now, after they defeated the Seleucid kings... Um, they rededicated the temple. And this rededication of the temple after this desecration is what is celebrated in the Feast of Hanukkah. You remember that? That is, occurs at the same time as Christmas, which causes us all to be politically correct and say happy holidays rather than Merry Christmas. Hanukkah uh, is the feast of recognizing the rededication and reconsecration of the temple. Now, for 100 years, the Jews were basically independent uh, or they were autonomous. They had their own kings, the Hasmoneans, and whatever, whatever. Until 63 BC, when Pompey and the Romans came in and conquered Judea. Pompey came into the temple, but he didn't touch anything because he had a respect for religion. And Herod the Great. Uh, who was an Idumean, who was Jews by conversion, uh, became the king of the Jews. Now, you remember Herod the Great. We're, we're in Jesus' time now. And Herod the Great, from 20 to 16 B.C., rebuilt the second temple, relayed the foundation. And this was called Herod's Temple. It was a rebuilding of the second temple, of Zerubbabel's temple. And this is the temple that was there in Jesus' day. Um, those of you who are going to Israel with me in October, we will stand at the Western Wall and we'll be able to touch these huge stones uh, that, that were part of Herod's temple going way back. And they say that if you keep going down, you will come upon the stones of Solomon's temple. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful experience. By the way, we still have room if you want to go with me. Anyway, um, and so the, the, uh, Herod rebuilt the temple, and this was the temple that Jesus saw. This was the temple that Jesus went into and cast out the money changers, saying, you've made my father's house a den of thieves. It was a beautiful temple. They had their sacrifices. They had their religion there, but it was devoid of the Spirit. It was devoid of the glory of God, and Jesus knew it. And he spoke of the Pharisees, you're white in sepulchers. You're white on the outside. You're dead on the inside. It was religious, but there was no dynamic there. The Spirit of God was not there. After Jesus died on the cross and was raised again, ascended into heaven, 50 days after the resurrection, or 50 days after Passover, was the Feast of Pentecost. The Feast of Pentecost was a Jewish feast. The people brought leavened loaves of bread into the temple and they waved them before the Lord as a thank offering. And on this day, the Holy Spirit decided to show up again in Jerusalem. But this time he didn't fill a building. He filled people. People. The new temple of God, people, 
joined to Jesus, joined to one another. And these people now became the temple of the Holy Spirit. There is that verse from the epistle lesson that has been in front of you from the time that I began. I just wanted to let it sit there and listen to this. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, meaning you're, the Jews are, were God's people. You're no longer outside of the ranks. You're fellow citizens with God's people. You're members of God's household. Get this, you're built on a foundation. The foundation is the apostles and prophets, the word of God, the apostles and prophets, the foundation of the church. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. Now, when we talk about cornerstone, we usually think of a little stone in the corner of a building which actually holds nothing together. You take it out, nothing happens. But the cornerstone they're talking about is the capstone that goes in the middle of the arch that if you take it out, the whole thing falls apart. Jesus is the stone that if you remove it, the whole thing falls apart. Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. Now, get what he says. In Christ, this whole building, you is joined together and rises to become a temple, a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. People, I've often defined the church as people joined to Jesus, joined to one another. The people of God, the temple of God, in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. And by the way, in 70 AD, the Roman, the Roman general Titus came into Jerusalem and utterly destroyed Herod's temple. Flattened it out, the stones, the foundation stones remain, the western wall, and never would it be rebuilt again. After Jesus performed the ultimate sacrifice on the cross, there was never a place for the sacrifice of lambs and goats and bulls for the forgiveness of sins since the ultimate sacrifice had been offered. There, are, there is, of course, Ezekiel's temple that's listed in the prophet, this third temple, which people say is going to be rebuilt before Jesus comes again. I, I, don't, I don't believe the PETA people would allow animal sacrifice. But anyway... Um, I, I, I believe this is the heavenly temple, but we'll see how that one works out, okay? I believe today there's a lot of confusion in the minds of people regarding this thing we call church. What is this thing we call church? You drive down the, build, down the highway, you see a bill, oh, look at the big, beautiful church. You come into the building, you say, is church over yet? Has church started yet? I'm a part of Messiah Church. I'm a part of Lutheran Church. Church, church, church. What is this thing called church? Do you know there is no precedent whatsoever in the book of Acts for Christians putting up buildings? You won't find it. The early Christians, they first met in Solomon's porch. They met in the temple, which I think is fascinating. The Holy Spirit came back to the temple in the, in the lives of the people, the people of God, the believers in Jesus Christ. And when they were kicked out of the temple, they met in homes. Um, if you go to the 16th chapter, the book of Romans, where they, Paul greets all these people, he greets a group of people who have a church in their home. The church met in homes. For example, in Corinth, they were kicked out of the synagogue and they went to the lecture hall of Tyrannus, which would be kind of like saying they went to the VFW hall. Uh, they met in homes. They met in public places. They met in the, in the temple area. Uh, there's no place where they ever erected a building. You don't find it. Now, if you go back, I hate these things. <laughs> Why can't they put it on your nose or something? Gosh. If you want to find the basis of the church building, you've got to go to Constantine in the fourth century. In 313, the emperor Constantine declared that Christianity was now the official religion of the Holy Roman Empire. 
Can you imagine that? You take a whole empire and say, now you're all Christian. You're all Christian. Open up the fire hoses in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What are you going to do with that? How, how do you deal with that? The church then became identified not with the people, but with the hierarchy, with the, the popes and the bishops and the monsignors and the priests and the cardinals. This was the church. This became Mother Church. And, and Mother Church had to do its thing in various places. So they, they built these big cathedrals where Mother Church can put on its glorious robes and do their thing, and everyone would come and watch the observers of Mother Church. And some of the great cathedrals, they actually had gates that separated that altar area where Mother Church does her thing from the people, and the people stood on the outside and watched what the church was doing. I hope you don't come into this place as an observer and simply watch what the church is doing. At the time of the Reformation, the, this whole idea of the church being the hierarchy um, was, was, how would you say, combated with the priesthood of all believers. Martin Luther taught that every person who believes in Jesus Christ is the church. The church is made up of people who believe in Jesus. The buildings then, Luther was not an iconoclast. He didn't go around destroying buildings and, and statues and so forth. The buildings now became places in the Reformation for people to be taught, to find out more and more about Jesus. For it was the church that was coming together in these places to learn about Jesus, to receive the Lord's Supper. Everyone was a part of this thing called the church. When I was pastor of a church in New York one Sunday, they had a lovely little church building. Everyone liked their little church building. And But one Sunday, there was an ice storm, and the electricity went out in the church, but it remained in the school. And we set up chairs, and we, 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 the church met in the gym. And I changed my whole sermon that day. I said, now you know what the church is. It's not, yeah, you don't become a, build, a Christian by sitting in the church. No more than you could be a car if you sit in the garage. It doesn't work that way. The church is the people, people who believe in Jesus, people joined to Jesus, people committed one to the other. And here you are, I said to them, meeting in this gym. Do you realize how perfect this situation is for you? There's no doubt in anybody's mind what the church is around here, I hope. It's certainly it's not a building. It's you, the people. And you come here, and you hear the Word of God here, and you gather around the Lord's table here. You do mission work. You, 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 you talk about the things that you're doing out in the world here. Not only that, the church comes in here and plays volleyball. The church comes in here and plays basketball. The church, you, the very people of God. If Schultz and Schley ever get in their head to erect the big cathedral in their honor, say no. You're perfect here. It's wonderful. I love it. This idea of people coming together in a practical way. Think of, I think of Robert Schuller and the Crystal Cathedral. Remember that 1980s hour of power? Well, when he retired, they went broke. They owed $54 million. And they, I thought it was going to be the world's only crystal indoor tennis center. But they went broke. You know who's got it now? The Diocese of Orange County, California, have purchased the Crystal Cathedral, and it's now a Roman Catholic cathedral. I wonder if Robert Schuller, with his great Reformed theology, knew that he was building a Roman Catholic cathedral. Very, very interesting. Anyway, think with me a second. To identify this thing called church, we have to do a lot of stripping away. There's a lot of stuff that we've picked up over the years that we have to strip away. Think with me. What if we had a government that came in and outlawed Christianity? What if all of the church buildings were confiscated? What if all of the clergy were thrown in prison? 
What if all of the seminaries were shut down, the Christian bookstores? There was absolutely no physical evidence of the Christian church existing in this place. Everything was taken away. What would be left? Some of you would say maybe nothing would be left. Yeah, there would be something left. What would be left would be in the hearts and in the lives of the people. The faith that belongs to the people. The relationship with Jesus and the relationship with one another that exists in the people. And when Schultz and Schley are in prison, I'm sure that the elders, are, uh, Tim and Andy and Mark, that get on the phone. Hey, folks, come over to our house tonight. We're going to study a little Bible. Don't tell anybody, though. It's kind of a secret meeting, you know. We're going to study the Bible, we're going to pray, and we're going to have some bread and wine, and, and if there's any babies, we'll baptize them. We're going to have communion. Come over to our house. Don't tell me the church would die. The church would go on because it's something that exists within you and within me, and it's the Holy Spirit binding our hearts together. We are this thing that is called the church. You see, this happened in China. I'm not just making up a story. There were Chinese evangelisms in the middle of the 1940s who went out and shared the good news about Jesus, and people came to faith. And they formed little house churches. Uh, they had no professional clergy. They built no buildings. They made no relationship from one church to another. Would you pick that up for me, Chuck? Because I might need them. Thank you, sir. You're a good man. Hi, I'm Don. Anyway, <laughs> and they built, they had no relationship between these individual churches so that when the communists took over, they could take away the buildings, they could take away the clergy, they could do all these things, but they couldn't take away what was in the hearts of people. And do you know that the church grew during the communist regime? Many were added to the church during the communist regime, and there was nothing they could destroy because it was invisible in the hearts of the people. You are the church of Jesus Christ, strategically positioned in this place with a blue ribbon school, with a desire for ministry, with a worship service that crackles with life, if people want to know what God is about, bring them here. Tell them to look at the people, look at the mission, look at the ministry, look at the joy, look at the children. Bring them here and let them look at the people sitting here, you, your commitment to one another, and find out what God is about. People in the church don't realize how important it is how important the relationships that exist between people are. You know, the devil doesn't care if the Masons don't get along. The devil doesn't care if your garden club doesn't get along. Who cares if the garden club doesn't get along? But the devil cares if the church doesn't get along. Why? Because if he could keep everyone at each other, if he could destroy the unity that exists among us, if he could take the love away that exists among us, we no longer have a witness for the reality of God in our midst. Jesus said that you people love one another, and if you love one another, people will know that I came to the Father. Folks, if you're just an observer of Christianity, if you come here and observe the church and, and go to the voters' meeting so you could pick at this or pick at that, don't get in the way of what God is doing. Last week, Pastor Schultz told us that we should stay on the same page in our relationship with the Lord. Get on God's page in our personal Christianity. And I want to tell you today, get on God's page when it comes to the church. Don't get all bent out of shape over, did you hear what she said here? Did you hear what she said here? And a little gossiping and all these little things happening in the church and, and people upset with this. Come on, guys, get with it. Get with God's agenda. God's agenda is to produce in this place a witness to his greatness, a witness to his love, a witness to his forgiveness. As people join to Jesus, love one another, and go out into this world and perform ministry, and people are brought here. 
the possibilities that you have in this place with the things that you have. <sighs> with the Holy Spirit's phenomenal. Phenomenal. Get with God's program. Get on the same page with God when it comes to his church, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, people. Join to Jesus in faith and join to one another, showing forth the praises of him who called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. Happy birthday, church. Amen. And may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds where they ought to be kept. And that is in Christ Jesus. Amen.